Okay. Um, we are going to start. Um, I hope the, 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 the attendees can all hear me. Can someone send me a, a little signal through the chat from the attendees? Am I, am I audible? Is everything okay? Yes, great. Okay. So, um, welcome to today's conversation on a Miss Ezer and Francoise Vergesse's Resolutely Black. Before I begin the introduction of myself and today's event, I just wanted to um, share one logistical um, a advice it with all our audience members. The chat, as you can all see, is open for you to chat, live chat as the event goes on. But questions uh, to the panelists, the speakers of today, will be posted through the Q&A um, a function button that is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So at the same same place where the chat button is, you will find the Q&A. And that is where the questions that you want to pose to the attendees should be posted. And that is where our moderator called Brito will be, will be selecting questions. So if you pose your question on the chat function, um, you might be reminded uh, or remind yourself to post it on the Q&A because those are the ones that will be eventually asked in the Q&A section of today's event. Okay, great. So I'm Natalia Brizuela, the co-editor with Leticia Sapsai of the Critical South book series at Polity Books, where Resolutely Black was published. Leticia Sapsai and myself co-edit this series, but we have a brilliant um, a advisory board that helps us cover the areas of the global south that we represent and among them we have the 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 honor of having Francoise Vergès. Um, the book series publishes the work of major thinkers and key emerging intellectuals from the global south whose interventions complicate both the north-south divide and the established Euro-American canon of critical theory. This book series is one of the numerous projects of the International Consortium for Critical Theory programs funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and it is in its Berkeley uh, um, a location, um, also a funded by the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research. Um, I want to thank the members of the consortium team, as well as the members of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research for all the work that they've done to set up today's event. I want to particularly thank Brianna George and Marlena Gittelman for their impeccable work. And before I introduce our speaker, our, our moderator who will introduce the speakers, I just wanted to say a couple very brief words on um, the relationship of Today, the, the, today's discussion with today's world. The worldwide anti-Black protest these last weeks in the aftermath of Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd's brutal mur murders at the hands of the police has brought a renewed sense of hope that a radically different world is possible, one free from the political and social structures of anti-Blackness, racism, misogyny, and many other forms of discrimination. These are today's protests, but we must remember and learn from the historical struggles that have been led by Black, Brown, Asian, and Indigenous people for centuries. The recent protests have also made evident that what happens in certain parts of the world, the US in this case, continues to receive a disproportionate attention compared to what happens in other parts of the world. Black people are brutally murdered by racist policing in Brazil, in Colombia, in France, and elsewhere. But because of persistent colonial and imperial structures, those murders, for the most part, go unnoticed. This disproportionate attention received by some countries over others, by some bodies over others, is a widespread historical phenomenon, and we must struggle and protest against that as well. Tomorrow is Juneteenth here in the US. 
And while slavery officially ended on June 19th of 1865, its structures remain in place through new institutions. So I would like to invite us all to occupy tomorrow. Um, I want to introduce Carl Brito, who will be our moderator today. He is an associate professor in French and comparative literature at UC Berkeley. His work focuses on Francophone colonial and post-colonial studies, as well as gender and sexuality studies. He is the author of numerous publications, among them the book Disorientation, France, Vietnam, and the Ambivalence of Interculturality. And I would also like to add that Carl Brito is a beloved and respected teacher here at UC Berkeley, where he was honored with the Distinguished Teaching Award some years ago. So I want to thank Carl and all of our panelists and Francoise Vergès, our co-author of the book, who is here from France, just arrived from a protest that I am sure she will talk about on the streets of Paris. And I want to thank all the attendees for being here today. Carl, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Natalia, and, and, and thanks again to everyone who has been involved in, in organizing this event. Um, it's an enormous pleasure and an honor to introduce the author, uh, public educator, and anti-racist decolonial act, feminist activist, Françoise Vergès. Um, really one of the most essential voices in debates on race, especially in France and its former empire, um, Francoise has published widely on colonial and post-colonial history, politics, and theory. Her many books include Monsters and Revolutionaries, Colonial Family Romance and Métissage in 1999, um, La Mémoire Enchaînée, Question sur l'esclavage in 2006, um, Féminisme décolonial 2019, and Le Ventre des Femmes, um, originally published in 2017 and about to appear, I believe, in English translation um, as The Wombs of Women, Race, Capitalism, and Feminism. Um, she is, of course, also the author of the book that we'll be discussing today, which grew out of a series of interviews that Francoise conducted with Aimé Césaire uh, a few years before his death in 2008. Um, and which was recently published in English translation by Polity Press under the title Resolutely Black. Um, I'm also very happy to welcome the translator of this work, Matthew Smith, who is Assistant Professor of French and Francophone Studies at Northern Illinois University. Um, Matt, Matt is a, a, a widely sought after and prolific translator. Um, among his recent translations are um, Jacques Roubaud's Sleep, preceded by saying poetry, and Frédéric Forte's Seven String Quartets. Uh, his translation of Karima Lazali's Colonial Trauma is also forthcoming from Polity Press, uh, I believe next year, 2021. Um, and finally, I'm also delighted to welcome Donna Jones, who is uh, an associate professor in the Department of English uh, here at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Donna is the author of The Racial Discourses of Life Philosophy, Negritude, Vitalism, and Modernity, which won the 2010 Scaglioni Prize for Comparative Literary Studies awarded by the Modern Language Association. And in addition to her position in English, um, Donna also serves as a core faculty member in the designated emphases in critical theory and uh, in science, technology, and society. Um, before we get started, just a few quick words about the format of today's event. Um, in a moment, I will turn things over to the panelists, each of whom will have five minutes to offer a few opening remarks and questions. Um, we'll then have about 25 minutes for discussion with the panel before opening up to questions from um, attendees. And as Natalia mentioned a moment ago, attendees can submit questions using the Q&A function um, on Zoom. Um, and, um, you know, I will, I will do my best to get to as many of them as possible during that 
part of the event. Uh, and then finally, Natalia will rejoin us just before 11.30 California time to, to wrap up the event. Um, so just to begin our conversation, um, I, I, I'd like to say that what I have always found so helpful about Francoise's work is the clarity and, and precision with which it brings to our attention um, long histories of colonialism, racism, and exploitation, not only as a part of the necessary work of narrating the past in the face of willful and often violent forms of ignorance, forgetting, and erasure, but also as a crucial element of ongoing projects of understanding and resisting uh, inequality in the present, um, and of course also of imagining different futures. Um, in, in rigorous and compelling ways, her work responds to what Francoise herself described quite beautifully in a recent interview as our state of being, quote, caught within multiple temporalities. Um, we must repair the past, which is far from being repaired. We must repair the present, and we must already prevent the future from becoming the past. Um, of course, Aimé Césaire was also deeply concerned with finding ways to speak of pasts that are far from being repaired. And Françoise, I'm so grateful that we have the chance to have this conversation with you today about Césaire's writing, his political stances, um, and your conversations with him in 2004, what they meant to you then, and what they mean to you now. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn things over to Donna Jones and invite you, Donna, to share a few opening reflections and, and questions. I believe you're muted, Donna. I guess that's the performative of Zoom now is to be muted first. Um, in any case, um, well, thank you, Carl, and thank you, Francoise. Um, this is a lovely opportunity to, to visit intellectually with a dear, dear, dear friend um, who I haven't seen in ages and who I respect immensely as an intellectual and as an activist. Um, um, and actually, it was really a joy reading this work in particular on um, Césaire. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about kind of the form of it. Um, but I think that, Francoise, this was your, your interview uh, filled so many essential gaps in Césaire, in, in our understanding of Césaire, in um, ultimately where and how Césaire not only fits in, you know, just the overall literary canon, but really um, the politics of Césaire, um, not only Césaire's political career, but in a sense, the politics of the figure of Césaire. Um, I think, you know, what I adored about your postscript in particular, the postscript concept conversation, um, was that you, you know, you really spoke eloquently to the urgency of Césaire's work and to Césaire's thinking and to actually Césaire's continuing work. Um, you know, part of the interview of Césaire is to think, was in 2004, was to acknowledge, recognize him as a persistent um, political figure, as a persistent intellectual figure, right? Um, and so he, you know, comes across as a figure who on the one hand embodies, you know, all aspects of the literary and the creative, right? I mean, the wonderful aspect, uh, the wonderful, um, I think, point where he says uh, something to the effect of, um, I get my bearings and discover myself in my poetry, right? I, having drawn that out is a really, that was, that was, a, that was illuminating to me, right? Um, you know, he then proceeded to speak and use this absolutely gorgeous poetry where, you know, I am the embodiment of a mute, um, I'm paraphrasing it, but I'm the embodiment of a, of a, of a mute center or something to that effect. Um, so that, how is it that, again, his bearings, right? That he begins with the poetry, right? And that is not 
um, that's political thinking there. And I thought that that was actually really quite, quite wonderful. But to get back to, um, to I think, the force of this interview and the proscript, um, again, I think, you know, the eloquence of the urgency of Césaire's work and political um, uh, work, and to think of him in that terms as embodied in both, you know, his poetry, his political work, his literary work and his um, political work. Um, and as well, um, and then as I, I think, you know, your, your caveat, which is, was I, um, um, and I appreciate this for you emphatically pointing out that you had no desire to read Césaire nostalgically, right? This isn't nostalgia, this is Césaire thinking here and now, politics, literature, right, at the same time. Um, um, so, um, so yeah, so I would like, you know, we can kind of extend that conversation and extend that conversation insofar as, you know, I think, um, uh, as we think of the kind of political work that needs to be done, um, and particularly right now, just, you know, the, the, um, the civic, um, uh, um, uh, project of all of us thinking about memorializations, monuments, history, anti-Black racism, the, the, the function of culture and politics, which we are thinking right now in this moment, um, where and how Césaire's, you know, um, you know, resolute uh, um, uh, desire to keep the literary and the political and you know, without you know, uh, you know, without uh, hedging any bets, right? Um, so I think that would be something I'd like to to talk about. Um, I also just really love um, your almost your genealogy of Césaire the figure, right? From Sarkozy through you know, kind of you know, the cynical appropriation of Césaire, right, by sort of neo, like writers neoliberalism to the kind of left version. Uh, via Hollande, you know, his, you know, so that Césaire becomes part of his like odd strategy of like appropriating Jay-Z and all sorts of things. And then, you know, Césaire's, you know, um, uh, you know, um, Césaire's own, right, resistance to being um, appropriated in such a way, right? Um, um, so I think that that is also a really fascinating aspect of this um, as well. Um, so that's something I would really, um, you know, like to think about. I think the work is also a work that contributes, you know, if we're thinking about, you know, this as part of, uh, you know, uh, an urgent need to decenter um, narratives of political activism, um, hit, um, artistic activism, these genealogies that, you know, if we're looking at this in the context of France, begin with the, you know, with 68ism. One of the things I thought was really fascinating was Césaire commenting on how ignored, right, getting back to Natalia's point, right, how ignored departmentalization was, right, how it was, a, you know, how it was a, something of a political blip. I, that was illuminating to me, actually. I have to say that, you know, when you study a topic, when you study colonialism and you study the history of colonialism, it be, you assume that it is something that is, you know, um, in the forefront, or at least, you know, out there, right? It's, you know, something that's being kind of debated. Um, but, you know, in the context of, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, Césaire talking about how this was, you know, sort of, um, you know, one of the, the, the last things that, you know, political aspects that, you know, uh, that France was really thinking about. It was a sort of an afterthought, right? Um, that was really fascinating. Um, and I would like if you could speak to, I mean, you know, I think part of this, like, as you're pointing out, is that, you know, what drove, what, um, what um, drove you to this interview uh, was the uh, uh, history of activism in your own family, um, you know, being, you know, so immersed in, um, you know, the politics of independence, the politics, of, of uh, the complex politics of, of, of um, independence in France and the repercussions of uh, departmentalization. Um, I found it utterly fascinating that, again, getting back to this figure of Césaire as both, um, you know, uh, you know uh, a figure that is literary and political that you cannot dis disaggregate either, um, was, you know, it's interesting to read him with someone like Senghor, who I also study, and to think about, you know, um, you know, again, 
a kind of genealogy of the uh, post-colonial nationalist uh, statesman literary figure, right? Culture and literature, of course, is something that, you know, culture, excuse me, and politics was something that, you know, throughout the, you know, the, uh, throughout the independence period and post-colonial period is, you know, bandied about and kind of bound together. Um, and it's really fascinating how um, not only pragmatic Césaire was, um, ultimately, um, but as well as um, how, you know, he was really quite conscious of the fact that he sort of fell in, that in a sense, not necessarily falling into politics, but falling into the statesman uh, position of the political. Um, you know, the, that administrative quality, that administrative position was something that he fell into, right? Um, and so that's rather, I think that was also uh, something that's quite interesting versus someone like Senghor for whom, you know, um, there was a, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, there was certainly, uh, and there was an attempt to keep uh, um, a symmetry between, you know, his poetic and intellectual thoughts and his statecraft, right, throughout, right, you know, I mean, you know, kind of a, whether or not in, as we, you know, certainly, you know, know that, you know, African socialism in, 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 in act, in, you know, as someone like Maris Conde and Harry Mokinon will point out, was certainly not achieved, but nonetheless, the fact that there's an architecture that, you know, these types of things. So again, it was really interesting thinking about it in that way. And again, my last word, I just want my foot to wrap it up, is getting back to the question of the, kind of the urgency of the now, the question that I would ask you is, um, it's funny too, because you brought up, you know, what is I think one of the most haunting and prescient and unresolved exclamations of Césaire's work, which isn't, is an, it, which isn't found in his poetry, but it's found in Discourse on Colonialism, where he, you know, announces, you know, Europe is indefensible, morally, spiritually indefensible. And that, of course, is haunting. It's haunting for a moment. It's haunting um, in terms of, you know, uh, when it was written, you know, in the period following uh, fascism. Um, it, it forces us to reckon with the genealogy of fascism that predates and that links it with colonialism and with the uh, project of empire. Um, and it's really interesting that in 2004, that it's, and I was gonna say in that interview, he, he doesn't spend much time on that. He sort of, you know, it's, it's a short, you know, uh, he, he sort of sidesteps it. And it would be interesting. I mean, you know, I would get your thoughts of like what he would say now <laughs> if presented with that, you know, because 2004, yeah, um, I felt it wasn't, uh, he didn't really address that, um, that sentiment. He, he was sort of like, yes, this tells us something about power in general. But it's such a powerful statement. I mean, you know, when we think about this in the context of um, where we are now, what is indefensible? Um, when we're interrogating, you know, more or less the structures of white supremacy, which, you know, is asking us to, to defend the indefensible, right? Um, it requires that we defend the indefensible, right? Um, and, um, uh, you know, what forms of resistance um, that uh, um, are necessary, both intellectual and in terms of our practices, um, you know. I'm afraid I'm going to have to jump in there, but thank you so much for those questions and those reflections, and I, I really look forward to hearing Francoise's response. Um, but before uh, turning to Francoise, um, I want to give Matt Smith a chance to offer some opening reflections, thoughts, comments, questions. Um, <laughs> I, I can imagine that the project, the work of translating this text was, um, you know, involved a lot of very, very careful negotiation with language. And you described some of that in the translator's note that um, I really, I really found um, valuable and, 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 and careful and, and um, full of interesting ideas about the translatability or the question of translatability surrounding um, concepts having to do with um, racialized experience. Um, um, and I was really, I went back to the original text and reread that as well. And, and just sort of noticing the kind of subtlety with which you made these choices was really interesting to me. And, and, and phrases like 
difference culturelle in the original becomes structural racism in the translation, for example, I think at one moment. And so I, I, I would be really interested to hear more as we have a conversation about the, the, how the two of you work together on the translation. Um, but, but first, I want to give you a chance to um, offer some thoughts. Thank you, Carl, and uh, thank you, Natalia, and for the, the, thank you to the organizers of this panel. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I was honored and humbled to be part of the project. Um, I learned a lot from it, uh, from translating the work, but also from all the research I, I did to, um, to prepare for the translation. And I just want to answer your, one of your questions that you raised really quickly, Carl, before I forget. So some of those, um, maybe it's a, a, a warning, some of those changes can be explained by the fact that uh, I wasn't translating from the, the, the edition that's available, but rather Francoise made certain changes. So some of them uh, might be decisions that I made, but a lot of them might have been changes that Francoise did in this new edition. Um, so I just, I'll, I'll talk briefly about um, what I was grappling with as a translator, and Carl already kind of mentioned this a little bit, and then I have uh, a couple of questions for Francoise as well um, that echo Donna's sentiments. Um, I, I guess the biggest issue, um, obviously, and what we're here to talk about is how to translate race and how to translate racism. Um, and it is a problem without a clear solution. Um, I was thinking about the problem in this way, and I try to state it in, my, in the note on the translation, is how can you re respect the diversity of Black experience um, while highlighting the common struggles and deeper histories that unite these different experiences? Um, I see this related to another point that Cesar raises in the book, uh, a different point, right, when he mentions that there are two ways of being forgotten, by being isolated into a distinct group and by being subsumed under the banner of universalism. Um, of course, here, when he talks about the banner of universalism, he's talking about the French Republican ideal, which entails um, suppressing or erasing one's ethnic or racial identity. But I think we can see that same dynamic at play when we think about um, uh, a, a kind of global or transnational black experience in the singular and the diversity of local black experiences in the plural. Uh, the singular I think is useful for a lot of different reasons. Um, it's very important for building a movement and an international coalition. Uh, it, it helps us to recognize the history of diaspora um, it, it allows to, us to see slavery as a global phenomenon that continues to shape structural relations today. Um, but it can also be somewhat reductionist. It can create false equivalencies. Uh, and then it also can neglect uh, local context. I think we see this in the US context when we talk about the black vote in the singular as though this were a homogenous group. Um, and I think anyone can tell you that the experience of an African American or black American in France is fundamentally different from a black African. Um, but at the same time, there's also a major risk in overemphasizing the differences between black communities. I think it can weaken the force of what should be a global movement. Um, it deflects attention away from maybe a common purpose and struggle. Uh, and I, I think we see it right now in France. Um, Francoise can probably speak to this um, more than I can in terms of the protests that are happening there, but there, uh, the last count I saw, there was 20,000 people in Paris um, protesting what started by the, the, the murder of, um, um, of George Floyd, but also um, uh, is a response to previous murders in France, including that of Adama Traoré, uh, who it's um, thought that he was killed also by a chokehold. And the protesters are uh, um, using these slogans and using the language of Black Lives Matter and white privilege. And this is being met with a reactionary backlash, which is very typical in France, uh, which claims that these terms have been imported from a US context, which we hear again and again, and that they have no relevance in France, that they don't speak to the local context. And so that's where the real risk is, is that um, by overemphasizing sometimes the plurality of experience, you can play into France's reactionary narrative, which loves to, to call out racism in the US and see what it has in its situation as fundamentally different. Um, so it's a, very, it's a very difficult issue. Um, 
and Francoise has talked about this. Um, I'm also reading, um, currently reading this book, book by Norman Ajayi, La Dignité et la Mort, and he makes this point as well. Um, and he talks about how in the US, Black experience is in many ways defined by police violence. Um, uh, and that the defining feature of Black experience in France might be slightly different. He, he thinks about it as a structural preclusion of, from signifying that, uh, that one is unable to cast oneself as Black on a public stage in order to make one's interests known or advance one's uh, problems and objectives. Um, and he also kind of, war at the same time, he warns against overemphasizing the differences. So that's the issue, as I mentioned at the beginning, that I don't think there's uh, an easy solution for it. And I tried to tackle that a couple different ways in the book, and we can get into that in detail a little bit later. And then the last issue that I think is, is worth mentioning, and I talk about this in my note as well, is that th there are no objective translations of any term, uh, especially racially charged ones. And the, the subject position of the translator is, um, must be acknowledged. And I tried to acknowledge that as well, that as a white male translator, I am aware of, of the privileges that I've inherited. Um, but that also, uh, I recognize that this imposes certain limitations on what I, what I can and can't say. I can't pretend to speak entirely in César's voice or Francoise's for that matter. Um, I can't impersonate them. Others might try. Uh, when Clayton Eshelman translates César, there's a shared experience there that, that can be given, uh, that can be materialized, I think, in the poetry. And we can almost hear César through the voice of Eshelman. I can't aspire toward transparency. I couldn't tr uh, aspire toward transparency in this translation. Um, I, but I don't think that this is altogether a bad thing. There's this sort of utopian dream that you hear about often in translation studies or, or for people that read a lot of translations is to find this perfect match between writer and translator um, such that two voices would blend together and merge and form one. And I think that I share that dream and I appreciate it when that, that is found. But I also think it can be useful to have a little bit of friction um, a little bit of tension that might force the reader to acknowledge the distance separating the two voices. And so that's, that's something that uh, I was trying to, to work to bring out in the translation. And then uh, I'll just say briefly, because I don't want to uh, go past my time here, that uh, I echo Donna's sentiments and just really en enjoying this book. W one thing that I, that I liked is that uh, through these conversations, it, they, it does feel much more like a conversation than you're typically used to seeing whenever a major intellectual figure is interviewed. And that's because I, I, I see in Cezanne's responses that he's acknowledging Francoise time and time again, acknowledging her presence there as an interlocutor and shaping his, question, shaping his answers, not only to her questions, but to her presence and who she is. And I think that that brings a lot out of him that we don't see in other interviews. I read a lot of other interviews and watched interviews with him yeah. preparing for this. And I feel like that's something that's very unique to this book. Um, and uh, I, I think we, we owe that to, to Francoise, to her, her, her work, her intellectual work um, and to her activist work. And you can see that there's a certain form of mutual respect there. Um, and then two other things that I found really striking in the book. One was, Don already mentioned it, the two issues that are understudied departmentalization, uh, Francoise gave a reason for that that I found very compelling, that it doesn't lend itself to this grand historical narrative. There's very little drama and triumph. Um, and so that, that's one reason that uh, it's talked about a little bit less than, um, than uh, um, the decolonization in other contexts such as Algeria. And then also this discussion about the potential consequences of overemphasizing maybe the colonized subject at the expense of the slave. And I think Francoise's work has already been an important corrective to this, but I'd love to hear more about um, what, how, that, how that shift to think about those two together or separate, but focusing more on the slave, the figure of the slave, how that might shift uh, our understanding and discussion of our present day situation.
Thank you so much, um, both of you, Donna and, and, and Matt. And um, I don't want to take any uh, time away from Francoise's response. There's a lot there that you could engage with and, and enter into. Um, so I, I'll, I'll just leave it to, to you. Well, first, uh, thank you to the organizers. Thank you to Donna and Carl. It's really great to see you, even though it's through the screen and through these new tools that we are talking through now. Uh, thank you also to Matthew because uh, when he found this title, Resolute Black, I was so happy because I wanted to have something that would be as strong as the French title with this affirmation of Césaire, Nègre je, suis, Nègre, je resterai, that could not be translated in English, of course, but that was, has to effectively carry that strength, that force of what he was saying. So thank you, really. I mean, you say so many things that will be difficult to answer to everything, but I will say that effectively, Donna, for me, what is important is also to show Césaire as a political theorist. And that his poetry is a political theory, is a political text, not in terms of politics as you know the West see it, but effectively, how do we speak politics in the South, in the global South? How do we speak politics when we come from, you know, enslaved country, colonized? We don't speak politics in the way of Hegel necessarily or Heidegger, whomever. So it's how do we understand politics ourselves? You know, so really, how do we understand? How do we see what is a political text? And for me, it was very important. Uh, in 2004, or four, most people thought that Césaire was dead, but also we had already, of course, all against, you know, anti-racist struggle in France. But I remember for me, discourse on colonialism and his letter of resignation from the Communist Party as extremely powerful. His text, his biography of Toussaint Louverture, his play on Lumumba, the play on the Roi Christophe, everything was effectively a long thought of what it is. What is emancipation? What is liberation? And what are the difficulty and the obstacle we found constantly? And what kind of voice and form of writing he found to discuss that? And that could not be constantly, effectively, what in the West is thought as a political text. I think that's very important to break the norms, you know, to break that. So, and of course, it's very interesting to speak about César now because you may know that on May 23rd of this year, some young people brought down the statue of Chelcher and uh, César wrote uh, on Chelcher. And of course, it was condemned in France, all terrible, all terrible things, Chelcher and so on. He was the one who abolished slavery and condemned also in Martinique by a lot of intellectuals, black intellectuals and black elected officials. And I wanted to discuss because two young women came up to say, um, to, to explain that, you know, they were taking responsibility. And I thought it was very strong, you know, that to see two young women, not again, you know, your men, and they say, okay, look, we said to the police, to the tribunal, we are responsible. If you are looking for someone, we are there. And so, but what I mean is like bringing down the statue of Chercher is the continuation of the questions that Césaire raised. What is to be free? And what is a long road to freedom? And that, that which bring me also to one thing that uh, both, I mean, Carl and Donna raised. It's what the fact that Césaire was not as celebrated as other black intellectual, because he was associated with departmentalization and not with independence, made me also rethink, again, the narrative of decolonization. And so how we discuss in terms of victory and defeat and success. And so what don't we, we should not revisit this term, defeat, victory, success. We shall also term that belong to the military vocabulary and that we know that if we were looking closely at the story of the oppressed, we could say, oh, it's a long history of defeat, right? Of crushing, insurrection, revolt, and then, but it's the story of victory of the idea that really never dies, of is constantly there. So it was also for me to reverse that idea of success, that independence was success and victory and departization was defeat. 
that they, there is, of course, depopulization was then totally transformed by the state in another form of dependency and of oppression. But this is also the function of the state of capitalism, right? Of transforming, of uh, trying to crush any victory and to pacify. So for me, it was really a, a very important that. Another idea for me from Césaire, which I think is very important today, especially in France, I'm not sure from the US, but is what you know, he called the boomerang effect in discourse on colonialism. That's, it's fundamental for me. That because the French say, oh, that happened over there. Of course, in the colony was bad. Some white people were bad, but this is not France, okay? So we, we have nothing to do with that. And so this uh, notion of boomerang effect is very useful to say, but of course, you cannot have racial laws over there and, and they stay over there. They're gonna come back. They're gonna contaminate, contaminate your art, your literature, your, your philosophy, your, your laws, everything. And then when people were, are telling me, we never had racial laws in France, and again, it's the US, right? Bad US, bad US, good France. And na under Napoleon, you had racial law in France, not in the colony. Interracial marriage were forbidden you know, in 1802 when uh, Napoleon uh, reestablished slavery. So we have all this to show the long history of uh, uh, the colonial republic, of the republican coloniality. And this for me, this is where Césaire. So rather than following the kind of chronology, the Western, the French chronology, colonialism, slavery, colonialism, independence, departmentalization, I see it differently. And I see, I look at it as why effectively you have departmentalization in Martinique, Guadeloupe, Guyana, and Réunion. What does that mean? What, uh, uh, what kind of revolutionary movement, anti-colonialist movement were there? What kind of anti-colonial thinking thought you had? And, and effectively, as, as Matthew said, not opposing them, not saying, oh, these were, you know, alienated people, were Hasirian people, were good, you know, like very heroic people. So it's really also, how do we rewrite the story of decolonization and anti-colonial struggle by, by effectively refusing that chronology refusing the notion of defeat, victory, uh, success. Because then we enter into the Western discourse of saying, look, you became independent and what happened? Dictatorship, uh, bad economy, uh, corruption, and so on and so forth. So this is, you know, it, it brings, it produce, um, that vocabulary produce a form of thought that continue the kind of racial thought, you know, Democracy can happen only with civilized people over there, you know, that kind of, so rather than see it like that, see it effectively, what is, uh, why do we have uh, this uh, defeat or, you know, or what I don't call defeat for me, I don't call them defeat. I know that departmentalization was wrong, but at the same time, the idea of equality that departmentalization was supposed to be was a strong idea and led to the following struggle in Martinique and elsewhere. And the, so this, uh, this question for me is very important. The, the question also of uh, Black Lives Matter today and uh, white privilege that of course in France, no, we, we, there was no white privilege and it, there was universalism. It's very interesting again, connected to this story of the statue, right? The controversy, uh, they say, okay, uh, the president say uh, the Republic will not take down any statue, as if the Republic has anything to say about statue, but that's all, you know, another thing. But in fact, the controversy is because it, uh, it is about the statue of military, white military men who led colonial uh, conquests and massacres and genocide. There is no, I mean, I don't know if we had asked to move the statue of Lamartine or Victor Hugo I don't think there would be that uh, you know, much controversy. And if we had suggested that to replace Lamartine with a white feminist, replace Lamartine with Simone de Beauvoir, I'm not sure we would have that controversy. The controversy is really because it's again about the colonial past of France and therefore the colonial present. And for me, this statue story is about the large anti-racist struggle. It's not, un it's not just about the statue. It's part, it's one element of the anti-racist struggle, the large anti-racism as a political struggle, not as a struggle just for whites, 
but a struggle to transformation. So this really um, is very important. And, and as was, uh, Carl was saying, uh, the, tonight uh, we went to a uh, Place Vauban in Paris, which is behind the Invalides, which is the celebration of Napoleon and military men and the Ecole Militaire. And you have a statue of Lyoté, Morocco, in the Indochina in Morocco, then the statue of Gallieni, then the statue of Manja of the La Force Noire, then the statue of, and it's full of, you know, uh, military men. But with Gallieni, what is interesting is on the, uh, is carried by four uh, female figures, you know, one represents Madagascar, the other one represents Africa, the third one represents Asia, and the force is Paris. And all of them are like that and carrying him as on their head, which of course carry, you know, the idea of women carrying something on their head in Africa and Asia, in Madagascar, but also it's the gender things of the white men above the, you know, the, this continent which are feminized, but in the colonial sense, you know, no men, real, no real men over there. So we crush them. It's genders, it's race, it's race, everything is a military white privilege. So for me, Césaire speak to our time, really to speak to our time, you know, really. It's very important to bring him back. He was someone, uh, he was absolutely charming, I have to say. It was a really, he was so charming and he was so full of courage. He was a very little man, very small, very proper, very well dressed, extremely elegant every day. He changed his tie, you know. He was kind of telling me, Did you notice my tie? I changed my tie and so on. It was like, it was so, so, and so much courage. He was like, so, like, kind, you know, in your face, you know, I am black man, in your face. You don't like it? Same thing for me. And it was this strength also which is for me part of the politics, part of saying no to respectability, to the politic of respectability, to say, yes, you know, I'm a, and um, you, even for instance, in the National Assembly, in his uh, speeches there, you, they are not really known, is constantly attacking French imperialism, French colonialism, French capitalism, constantly, constantly. So it's, it's never, is, is very strange because when he say, I'm just a poet, but he was in fact, absolutely speaking, constantly uh, confronting. And he was, uh, when they were racist uh, slurs at him and answered, he, he answered back, you know, like constantly. You know, he said, uh, uh, I remember there was uh, some guy who said to him, oh, but uh, when we, uh, your ancestor were just, you know, not civilized and running around with a bone in their nose. And he said to him, you know, perhaps, but yours were in the mud with no light and anything and did not know how to read. And I, so it was constantly never, never let it go. And this also, I think it's part of the political struggle, that courage, that taking risk, that, you know, like, no, you will not, I will not bow my head in front of you. I will not respect you, you know. I will say what I have to say, and I will say it. So for me, all of this, you know, the, the boomerang effect, the no to the political of responsibility, no to the to, uh, understanding departmentalization as a colonized departmentalization today because of the state, and the state protecting, in fact, white privilege and white economic interests of the Beke, as they are known in Martinique. This, um, this, absolutely deep, deep, deep love for blackness and deep, deep love for his country. He had a deep love, which I also found in my father uh, and I found also in this young woman who brought down the statue of Cherchère, a deep love for this small island that do not matter much in the vast history of, you know, and the, and the certainty something is happening on this island that matter. And we don't need to belong to a big nation. We don't need to belong to a big country. We matter. Our lives matter. And what we have done is very important. And that for me, it's also, um, again, this kind of a macho uh, vocabulary 
of, uh, of uh, you know, what is important, what are the big things. And, and really for me, that's also what's important. And also, Donna, was, when you talk about the versus angle, Césaire always refused any title, honorary title. He refused to be a minister in, uh, in um, Mitterrand government. He refused to be at the French Academy. He, you know, it was like really, for him, it was Martinique. And this also is very important to, to think about, to think about that, uh, that, Mar that uh, refusing to go to France, to become someone in France, where well, was someone, but non nonetheless, I will not go. I will stay in Martinique, you know, and perhaps uh, it's not a big place, but this is my place. This is my place. This is my, and I, the, it matters. And I think that for me, it was also important because also I come from a very small island that do not matter much. And that's very important. And I, um, and what Matthew was saying that in, uh, that effectively specific situation in France and the U.S. I mean there was a long battle with the U.S. Right? Sometimes the U.S. are good; it's very interesting, and sometimes they are bad. For slavery, they are bad, right? I mean slavery happened in the U.S., never happened in France, and anyway in the U.S. they do very bad things, right? We French don't do that, and so you have to remind them that effectively they did, but they. The fact that you know, black um, Harlem Renaissance poet came to France, live in France, and so on, it's constantly brought. The fact that also the French army refused segregation, you know, the US army. So it's always the French saying, look, we were universal, we are universal and the US. But so it, it also hide and dissimulate the kind of racism, the kind of racist practices and racist love that exists and that perhaps effectively are different from one place to the other. But the end result is always the same thing. It's racial oppression, right? So that's that really. And um, uh, the last thing I will say also, and it connect to one thing of what you said, Donna, it's also connect us to what we call l'outre-mer, the overseas department, the overseas territory. The fact that France is one of the, practically the last state in Europe to have so many territories around the world and what does that mean? What does that say about the Republic? What does that say about the political race, you know, in France? And effectively also the racialized community in France. But what does that say? What does that say of a place which were a um, slave colony and that post-slavery colony like uh, Kanaki and the territory in the Pacific? And that for me also matters. Uh, and it's not really very much discussed, even in, among scholars of post-colonial France. It will be focusing on the, on the racialized community in France, but like no clue about what's happening. No clue of the way the white privilege is being played out over there. If you are French or white French and you arrive in this place, you are the king, the king of the place. It's totally colonial. It's a colonial relation. It's a colonial culture, colonized culture, um, everything and also with also what you say at this conjuncture when we are speaking also about you know environmental injustice, racial, racialized environmental injustice, um, the fact that the, the externalization of pollution, the pesticide in Guadeloupe and Martinique, the chlordecone, the nuclear tests in the Pacific that are you know have today children are being born with leukemia, uh, the nickel industry in, in uh, Kanaki, which is totally polluting, the, the politics of migrant, anti-migrants in Mayotte, in the Comoro Island. And so all these little places like that, that are dissimulated, when in fact, the, really, the colonial racial politics are uh, continuing. Um, and this is, I think, for me, it's extremely important to be discussed. What in when we think about the decolonial movement, what does that, what happening in these places? What is to be black in Mayotte, you know, blackness in Mayotte, blackness in Martinique? And um, why, um, why effectively this, uh, this question is, has been pacified? This idea has been totally, um, uh, at the time of Césaire, Césaire was bringing the voice of the overseas in the National Assembly, constantly reminding you have colonies. And today, nobody is reminding France that they are, I mean, among the elected at the National Assembly, you will never hear that word. 
it's among the activists that you hear that word, that yes, French still have colony. How do you gonna call them, you know, exact colonies? Colonies in the 21st century. So there, of course, they are different, but yes, colonies in the 21st century. I have not answered to everything because it was so, there were so many things and thank you so much for everything, but I, do, I don't want also to take all the time. I suppose, you know, perhaps it would be interesting to have a conversation. Thank you so much, Francoise, for those, uh, those responses and those thoughts and, and for extending the conversation. I think this would be a good moment to um, shift over to the questions and answers um, with the attendees. Um, people have begun to submit uh, questions. And so I uh, will just uh, read aloud um, the first question that came in, which is um, not as much a question as a request to comment. Um, how is it to be resolutely Black in Europe, oh, sorry, in France these days, and how does it distinguish, or how is it distinguished from the rest of Europe? Is there, um, I mean, this is actually very much linked up to what you um, were just talking about, and also um, Matthew was talking about in his comments, that there, there still exists in France, of course, such a powerful sense of um, exception, right? The, the, the exceptional status of, um, a, a supposed commitment to uh, um, a universal humanist values, right? Um, so um, I guess the question or is simply inviting you to reflect a little bit about mm -hmm. the current status of Blackness in France and its relation to, to elsewhere in, in Europe. Well, um, I will say, of course, there is a lot of anti-black racism in France, but there is also something that is new. For instance, last year, there were I would say, um, 15 uh, black actresses, you know, who had a book saying black is not my, my job. You know, I mean, you, I cannot be defined why when the people call me, I have to play the cleaner or the prostitute or the sex workers or whatever. So it's something are changing, things are changing. There was a sense, and effectively the demonstrations and marches that we have, we see a lot of young people. I receive also things from students of uh, art school saying that the curriculum is totally wrong, you know, your center's teaching. So there is a sense of a, of a, a new form, sense of blackness. Um, but of course, I mean, the, the French, um, it's moving a little, there is a certain recognition but for instance, uh, people are fighting in France for not being called black, but noir, because there is also this way of taking a word from English as if there was no word in France, which is a way also of, of you know, getting a distance from the, from the question, as if black was coming from the state, but you know, noir is there, you know? So there is that. Um, but, um, I will say one thing that the Matthew was talking about. I think the question in Europe is still the question of slavery, of colonial slavery, not really fully acknowledged. You know, Denmark, Sweden, um, all this, you know, what, what met Europe? What, what happened in Europe, you know? And what is Europe today? And how is connected with this long, you know, this four century? of slave trade and enslavement. This is a little still push aside. There was a big difficulty to, to you know, of the recognition of that. And we see that, I mean, there is something about what is Europe and how Europe was made through that, which is still, you know, a little uh, uh, put at distance. I remember some years ago, I was in Utrecht about the Treaty of Utrecht would put the end of the Thirty Years' War. There was no word about the fact that at the end, I mean, among the, the treaty, there was this special uh, uh, article giving the asiento to the England, I mean, the, you know, the monopoly on slave trade, which effectively transformed England in one of the most powerful maritime power at the time, and also effectively, totally uh, encouraged slave trade. And so there was practically nothing about that. And it was extremely important because two thinkers really uh, uh, fed the thinking. One was about that um, you cannot have a wealth in Europe without the colony. That's very important, right? And that was part of the economic thinking. And the other one was the idea of Europe. 
you know, and it was a, a French, Saint Pierre, and the, the, the other one was in English. The idea of Europe, that Europe was something united, a unity. There was a unity, and that unity was being Christian, being white, and sharing some philosophical idea. So the idea of Europe as well was also as it was the first big diplomatic moment in Europe, bringing many countries together. And so this is really always marginalized, constantly marginalized. We see it even in the controversy around the um, uh, looted uh, object from Africa uh, after the, the report uh, written by Phil Winsard and Benedict Savoie, that if, oh, we would need that, but then after when there is a question of restitution, oh no, impossible, you know, museum suddenly, European museum become the museum of humanity or the universal museum. So you do see that there is still really in Europe the question of blackness is still not resolved. And I think for me, it's really connected with the question of enslavement. Uh, there is, as, as Matthew was saying also, uh, there is a, um, it's, it's easier to discuss the Algerian war in France than to discuss enslavement. And then, you know, there is a recognition because it's maybe part or so, there is a cinema there, are, you know, there is also a part of the culture, popular culture on that. Uh, whereas uh, there was none about, and there was really difficulty. I remember some years ago when I was talking about uh, slavery, when I was doing the work on the memories of slavery, a lot of French were telling me our ancestors were neither slave trader nor slave owner, so that was bad, but I have nothing to do with that, right? Nothing to do. And, uh, and for me, it was, you know, to do this visit in Le Louvre, that called the, the slave in Le Louvre, an invisible humanity, and it was to say, to go to the painting, the first painting when you see men smoking a pipe. So when tobacco has entered the social and cultural representation of masculinity, and it's 17th century, you have tobacco before, but that. And so, okay, your ancestor was neither slave trader nor slave owner, but they smoke tobacco. They put sugar in their coffee. You know, they have coffee, they have chocolate, they have cotton. They, they, uh, the industry, the maritime industry, were flourishing, thanks to the slave trade or, and to, colonial, to colonies after. I mean, there were many things. So, so it's that question again of boomerang effect, the, the return of the oppressed, and that you have to explain. And it's still very difficult in Europe to that. It's really, uh, in England a little more, uh, but in Spain practically nothing, in Portugal practically nothing, it's just starting. Uh, and uh, so it's really, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, the question of slavery, again, for me, uh, as Mathieu said, is central, because for me, it's really the formation of Europe, really, really the formation of Europe, as Europe, the idea of Europe is, uh, is really, and then the question of enslavement connected with the idea of who, what is a black person, you know, who is a black person, uh, the black man, black woman, and therefore white woman, and as I was saying, you know, how do you revisit, therefore, many history, even the history of European feminism, which is, you know, calling this incredible struggle for rights that culminate with the right to vote. And I always say that, um, that in fact, of course, white women did not have the right to divorce, to uh, go to school, to become a lawyer, to become a doctor, but they had the right to own human being. They were slave owner. They were at the head of plantation, and this was not because of their gender, but because of their color. So the history even of rights, feminist rights, can be revisited through that. So there was a lot in Europe that really is um, absolutely hiding this question of enslavement, of really lives that were disposable, totally disposable, and which still feel the way you, uh, the West think of itself. And we saw it again, I mean, sorry to say that, but during the last, uh, uh, you know, uh, pandemic, you know, who died? People in the 93, which is the poorest department in France, and where you lot more uh, black and Arab people. So there is still, who is, you know, the essential work that has to go out to work so that the bourgeois could have this, you know, comfortable life. It was the woman who cleaned the, the, the place, the, the uh, men who pick up the garbage, all racialized poor people. So that 
question of you know what is the comfort, the good life of white European rest since slavery on the exploitation of black and, and, and brown bodies. And that I think is very important to absolutely remind. So I will say, yes, the question of blackness in France and in Europe is connected, is still connected with uh, the, ref um, n we will not talk about reparation. There will be no okay. talk about reparation, none <laughs> whatsoever, right? And, um, and, that's it. and again right? today, just one thing, uh, yeah. every time you talk about slavery, people will bring the slave trade from the uh, Arab. Yeah, every mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. every time, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and you write at, at different moments in the book, in your um, post uh, post fast. Um, I mean, the, the the phrase that you use to describe this is the blind spot, right? So that slavery is both constitutive in the most profound ways of Europeanness and whiteness and is constantly, and this gets back to the, the sort of violent backlashes that Matt was talking about as well, you know, the, the, the constant uh, erasure of that history, the constant forgetting of that history, the constant unwillingness to engage with it. Um, um, so I, I, I want to move to another question that um, I think is, is, is an interesting and important one, and I would also invite um, Donna and, and Matt to, to, to respond as well. Um, if you have thoughts about this, um, uh, Francoise, you acknowledge at the end, the, near the very end of the, the, the post fast for the, uh, the new edition, um, that it, as you, you put it, if one thing is lacking in Cesar's work, it is a discussion of how women of color are impacted by the system of racialization, right? And this ties in directly with a question that was posed um, asking if, um, if you or other panelists could speak to the fact that Cesar asserted, asserted masculinity even as he contested white masculine privilege. Um, and the question that is, was his assertion of, of existence bound up with an anti-colonial position and a different version of masculinity, and how did he think about feminism if he if he did? Um, so I would invite, yeah. Donna, the, I mean, I will let Donna and Matthew first to answer first. You know, my oh, you know, actually, um, I had another point um, <laughs> that I wanted to make when you were talking about the idea of Europe. Um, which is to say that, you know, um, as that, you know, blackness also means, an, or, you know, um, certainly Europeanness means being able to embrace a particular type of abstract identity. And that abstract identity is one that, you know, for example, you're talking about essential workers and throughout, I mean, this is a, what is like uniform when we look at the US, New York City in particular, who are the people who are dying in the pandemic, black and brown workers, women, right? Um, in the UK, in France, right? So the that abstract identity of a worker being understood as worker, as opposed to just like kind of, you know, uh, fodder, right? Um, is also something that women and that blackness is denied, right? So getting back to, I think with, um, with uh, so I just wanted to kind of leave that there because I thought that that would be a, a segue as well because what is it about white womanhood that is, uh, you know, enabled ownership, right? Of, of a partial identity, that is that you can own bodies, right? You can have a certain, you know, um, foot into, uh, you know, um, uh, enfranchised citizenship, um, and, um, you know, wherein, when we, you know, you know, kept thinking again back to Cesar's letter and to, to the French Communist Party, you know, um, and this desire to maintain a kind of resolute blackness, right, um, is to speak to a space that, you know, um, uh, ultimately, uh, hopefully would provide, you know, that speak to a space that, you know, is not it's not easily taken in or even just denied, right? You know, being recognized as the people who are in fact doing this work, right? Um, who are the essential workers, who are, you know, dying 
um, um, without mourning or without, um, you know, who are allowed to die, who are basically in very biopolitical ways, you know, you know, let them die, right? Um, I'm sorry, that took us away from the, the question of feminism, which is, of course, central to that, right? Um, where does, you know, where do women fit into this? Um, and, you know, in, you know, Cezanne's ideas of, of kind of, of, a, of a resolute blackness, right? Um, does that foreclose the possibility of, does that foreclose the voices of women, political, women's political agency, black women, brown women's political agency in this? So anyway, I, sorry, that, that was a little no, that bit. Was, that was, thank you, Donna. And I think that it does, as you say, it does very much feed into the question. And, and, and in fact, Francoise's, uh, the book that I mentioned that's just coming out in translation in a couple of months on sort of reproductive biopolitics in yeah. the context of the French uh, colonies, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, I think absolutely it's a, it's a, it's a linked question. Um, On the question of masculinity and Cesare, I mean, there are two things. I mean, first, I would want to say a point to what Donna said. Yeah. Uh, I do think, effectively, we have to think on the way in which um, cleanliness of the white world is done by brown and black body. So there is a connection between the production of waste, which is the production of capitalism, gender and race, right, and 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 black and brown body, female body, and also some black bodies who clean. And there is a connection also that also is related to slavery. During and slavery, the end slave, we are cleaning everything. We are taking care. I mean, there was a certain form even of intimacy that could be in, in front of them, right? Because they did not they were not, did not really exist. But they have to clean these white people. They have to take care of the children or the shit, right? Really, really to speak. And today it's still like that. I'm working with a woman who cleaned the hotel. And they are telling me how they are absolutely incredibly scandalized by the way in which people leave their room. There is something about, you know, that, that is really dirty as if in that room white people perform you know like wasting around because black body and brown body will come to clean there is something that they, they will not do at home but they do in the hotel because they know the black woman the brown woman will come and clean there was a connection with the 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 way in which the west presented itself as civilized and clean and hygienic which in fact rest on the fact that these people have to clean the excrement and everything of the white people, but they are also to live in place that where you will have no as much cleanliness, right? The popular neighborhood will not be as clean. So there was even in that ideas of you know what is hygienic, what is clean, what is beautiful, the beautiful place in which you live, which is reserved for the white people, and that is guaranteed by this black and brown body who have to come very early in the morning or late at night. They cannot be seen, they cannot be heard. But then after, uh, you know, the white woman, the white feminist woman will be sure that she can go to her yoga place. And then when she has finished her yoga place, she's gonna have a detox, you know, a toast in the place. And then she will go and all that. And in the meantime, she will talk about feminism and human and rights. But all this trajectory will have been clean and made, you know, comfortable for her body to walk around. So there is that. And the question of masculinity is connected in a way. Because also black men were also transformed into this body that clean, that are, you know, effective, that effectively not really, as we know, black masculinity was extremely stigmatized. It's a very something that has to be discussed, Cesar. I, I, I just, I, one thing I would not want to say, sorry, is also what we have to recover, we as, as scholars and activists, is the history of women fighting in Martinique and in Guadeloupe. You know, women association, which are absolutely unknown. We don't know, we don't know their name, we don't know their struggle. We don't know the name of the first black woman who went to the National Assembly. She was from Guadeloupe, Gertie Archimède, 
she was a lawyer. When Angela Davis came through Guadeloupe after staying in Cuba and was the passport were confiscated, she was a lawyer, Angela and her friend from Puerto Rico. And then they connected together. So this connection of black women, you know, of course like that, from Guadeloupe, from these smokers, is not known. So that is our work to do, Donna. We have to do this work to bring that back. So, because we have then to show, and of course there have been the work on Suzanne Césaire, which have been totally forgotten, and who was, we know, in fact, really behind Tropic, the, the, the journal that was, you know, uh, during the war, World War II. So there are figures that have to be uh, reconnected. But the, there was something, I mean, to finish, about Césaire, uh, in, in his play, and the, the women are, the female figure are, I mean, we can discuss about it. But himself, he was, uh, I think, I think he has a, a very private, very protected person for, I don't, you know, I don't want to enter things. And, um, and one point during our talk, we were in your car, he wanted to show me around and so on. And he took my hand and he said, it's really very difficult to become hot, you know, and that, and to be alone. And there was something that was said without, you know, I did not want to pry, you know. But there is also perhaps uh, in, in Cesar that his question of black masculinity, something that was about the fact that it could not he was forbidden to be fully, you know, himself. He had to contain himself to survive. And that certainly uh, was very, took a lot of place for him, you know. He was not, he, he barely talked about his mother. Barely, not about his father either. Kind of made himself in a way, kind of reinvented. As, as you know, when, I mean, he said that quite often, he was so happy to leave Martinique when he left Martinique for Paris. He said, finally, I will be free. I will be free. He hated the Martinique and Petit Bourgeoisie, where his sister were. So there was also something perhaps uh, in the question of masculinity that I, will, uh, that I will not also make perhaps a theory of that, you know, uh, but perhaps there is something that could be explored through, or through the life of uh, of a young man from Martinique, young black man from Martinique, arriving in Paris and, and making his, his way and becoming this poet, this incredible poet, in a certain solitude, I will say, in a certain solitude, that may have be the price he had to pay. And even though he was married, he had children, there was something with him which was always very, um, uh, and he was very social, but no, the que this question of uh, uh, the intimacy he, he, that certainly, and that's something that uh, um, people of color talk about, that um, the difficulty of intimacy, the difficulty of the privacy, because you are constantly under the gaze, you are uh, black people, we are forbidden to have family, were forbidden to have relations with their children under slavery. Uh, even after slavery, uh, in Réunion, pe young people were taken from their parents in the US also, uh, you know, Native American children or black children. So there is something that is really, um, that I think we should talk about this violence, the violence that is made and that is not necessarily beating people or killing people, which of course, but this constant, violence on life, you know, on, on, on the, that uh, forbid you to become a, whomever you will become, but a full human being. So the life that do not matter is not just about the life that can be killed, but the life that cannot be fully, you know, developed as they could be developed, you know, that, that as we want that, that for me, that what matters. So the love that matters is not just about the love that cannot be mourned, that can, can be killed, the body that can be killed, but this life that is constantly restrained and contained from the time you are very little to the end of constantly the fear of being attacked, the fear that you have, the, the feeling that you will never be able to completely, 
you know, become what you want to become, to follow also, as we say, you know. I mean, we have so many examples of young black people or Arab people here that they say, oh, you want to do philosophy? You want to do law? No, please, you know, you can become what other technician. So this constant, constant constraint, uh, I think that also Cesar spoke about in his poetry and in his play, less in his political text, but in his, in his play, when you read, when you think about Christophe or Lumumba in a season in Congo, they are men that are really, they, they will want, you know, they are full of, of energy or whatever, and they constantly constrained, you know, like, uh, by the forces that, and he showed that, you know, in a form of tragic way, you know, of, of that constant, uh, uh, weight and, and that is put. So perhaps I would say that question of masculinity could be explored that way also. Thank you I so can just much, add, Francoise. And, uh, yes, please, Matt. If I could just add one point to that. Um, this issue did come up in the translation as well. Um, and it was almost alarming how much he uses the word um, man. And when I shared an early draft of this with some colleagues and friends, they they singled that out as well and they they found it to be a little bit jarring and, and off-putting and so it left me in this interesting dilemma but one where i felt like there was a little bit more wiggle room where i could maneuver given my subject position on this part and i i didn't want to undo these contradictions whatsoever mm -hmm. but i also was kind of thinking about what what kind of intervention is this book making in 2020 and uh it felt, at least to readers that I sh shared the early draft with, almost a distraction. So I have to say that I settled on a, a certain kind of compromise so that uh, whenever I felt like Lum was being used in a kind of anthropological sense, and it's hard to know what to attribute to so a kind of linguistic habit that he unthinkingly inherited, but didn't challenge, right? That I think it, it's good to call him out on that. Um, versus something that might reflect a worldview. Uh, and I didn't want to make an argument one way or another on that. So w whenever there was a kind of anthropological sense of how he used l'homme, I tried to see if I could generalize it or do away with it altogether. So la poésie révèle l'homme à lui-même. Um, poetry reveals man to himself. I just translated it as poetry is a form of self-revelation. Um, mm. Elsewhere, anytime he mentioned fraternité or... Uh, or, or um, explicit references where there's a moment where he says, you're a man, I'm a man, we're brothers. I left it because I thought that, that it was important in terms of this concept of fraternité. And also I didn't want to completely undo that contradiction and make it invisible. I thought that it was important to have moments where we could see that his language is very much male-centered. But uh, I was concerned that it, it was going to become uh, a distraction and that people would mm. focus more on that point than mm. maybe some of the other issues that I think are really important that that, um, that Francoise mentions. And I was happy to see that she addressed it and I thought that uh, it wasn't unacknowledged, but it was addressed in a way that I think put it into context and felt like, yeah, it's something we need to acknowledge, we need to address, and we need to take it upon ourselves. It doesn't matter that uh, it's not a point of um, dismissing his body of work because of of this point. And Thank I you meant so you, you know, in French, I mean, lom, 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 lom. I mean, it's now very, you start to say l'être humain rather than lom. Otherwise, in French, it's lom, 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 lom. Um, so I, I just want to acknowledge and apologize. Many, many people have asked really brilliant questions. And I, I, I believe that Francoise will um, be able to see all of those questions, um, even though we're not going to have time to address them all here. Now, I think we actually only have time really for one last question. And I thought I would um, uh, take a, 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 or try to distill a question that has been asked in a few different ways having to do with the ongoing pressures of universalism in France and this notion of um, a negotiation with European culture that presents itself as, as universal, right? Um, so one way that the question was formulated had to do with whether or not within César's um, uh, poetics and politics, there is space for a kind of um, uh, 
peripheral relation that does not necessarily have to be routed through the metropole. Um, mm -hmm. So much of his biographical self-presentation in the context of, of the interviews, as you just mentioned, Francoise had to do with this real desire to leave Martinique, to go to Paris, to enter into this phase of his education. Mm -hmm. I was really struck later on in the interviews when you posed the question of um, cultural formation or what cultures, sh mm -hmm. what cultural products should, should people be engaging with. And, and in 2004, César speaks of la culture universelle, right? Mm -hmm. And he lists um, Greek, Latin, Shakespeare, mm -hmm. French classics, the Romantics. Mm -hmm. um, that, that commitment was still very, very much part of how he mm -hmm. articulated mm -hmm. his formation and the possibilities it offered. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's a hard question to know exactly how to frame, but I just wondered maybe mm -hmm. as, uh, by way of a closing reflection, if yeah. you had thoughts about that um, mm -hmm. dynamic in Cézanne's work mm -hmm. and whether there's a, mm -hmm. a, a way to move mm -hmm. around it or beyond it or mm -hmm. through it. Just... Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, it's such a good question. I think I, I, I tell the story that I have brought him many books and they were, uh, you know, books about Africa or whatever, but they were the last Greek uh, Latin translation right. to France from, you know, the very classical publishing house in France. And he went straight to this book, you know, and I'm like, oh, well, I brought some book about race in France and colonialism. No, he went straight, he started to look at them. And I was like, okay, you know, and in fact, it, it, he took uh, this book with him, and then the, uh, the other were left in his office. <laughs> anyway, at least, you know, I, I thought for me it was just a gesture, you know, kind of a homage to what he has been in the normal year, but just that. But, okay. So that effectively was a, a surprise uh, for me. But uh, you're right, Carl, and I think that also still something that was very strong for him. And that universalism, he thought, will free him from this petty bourgeoisie of Martinique. I remember he never, never wrote in, in Creole. Never, never. And he did not speak Creole when he was doing his speech, you know, as, as a political person in Martinique. Once, one or twice, but not very much. And that generation did never spoke Creole, even though in their most anti-colonial speeches were in French, very good, incredible, beautiful French. So there was something about the French as, as a, what Katabia Sin say, as a putain de guerre, you know, taking the language. But also I think that for that generation, uh, universalism represented some freedom from a colonial world in a paradoxical way. Because the colonial world was not, it was very, very narrow. And in a way, universalism went against that narrow world of colonialism. It was returning, you know, the, the, against the colonizer, its own uh, weapons. That one thing. And at the same time, as we know, uh, in his play, the play are always in the Caribbean or in Africa. Uh, is, is poetry is about, you know, I mean, of course, uh, return to my native land is absolutely, at the same time we know he was, when he was in, in uh, the ex-Yugoslavia that he saw in Ireland, started by Martinique and wrote. So there is something of, I would say, of, of kind of two space, the space of the, you know, the terrain that, that nourish him to write, to the poetry, the play, the text, the political text, the speeches, is Martinique, deeply Martinique, and the Caribbean, mm. because you will have also Africa also as a place, you know, that it, it remains very important for him, very absolutely deep. And that idea of the universal. Remember that Cesar and Fano uh, uh, argue for a new humanism, sorry, you, you know, that we have to invent. There's something that is being discussed today as, no, that's not the point. We should not look for a new humanism, we, but another idea of humanity, you know, perhaps in the, in, 
following all the work by Caribbean philosopher or black philosopher today in Brazil or elsewhere. You know, that the point is not a new humanism, but a new conception of what is humanity, what is to be human in the world, you know, in the world that is being destroyed by capitalism, by racial capitalism. So um, I would I would just say, you know, that was um, that can have to be understood then, and it cannot, you know, that and and perhaps we can see it in that context at the place. Uh, it's the same thing that when Fanon, uh, you know, joined the Free French, you know, as as there was something about that was, uh, you know, that that played still, and that. Um, um, Europe still w w represented not colonial Europe, but revolutionary Europe. So, um, and that connection um, is it, it has not really been explored because the narrative has been taken over by the French left of uh, really what uh, Caesar called fraternalism. But what what are what did the colonized taught to the French has not been explored. In which way revolutionary thought, European revolutionary thought, was fed by revolutionary thought from the global source has never been examined. You know, so that also something. So therefore, there is still something that, as Cesar Pano, or you know, are deriving from uh, French uh, European humanism. So perhaps there is still something to explore there. But yes, the universal, I will say, well then for Cesar, especially in the 40s, you know, early 40s, escaping Martinican colonialism, colonial thought and colonial life. It was opening. And so we see it, of course, as, as something still really caught, but we have to think about a young, black men from Martinique at the time, you know, and we could think about long song youth arriving in Europe, you know, or the men, or, um, I mean, some of the things that you played at one point uh, for some African revolutionary or so, that you are played a moment. So it's not the West that we think about, it's a Europe where they could, uh, escape and meet with revolutionary thought and discuss and brought their own thing. And uh, that, uh, we can see it like that also. Thank you so much, uh, Francoise, Donna, and, and, and Matthew, all of you. It was really a, a, a great discussion and I'll turn things back over to Natalia now. Yes, thank you. I think that was a, a perfect um, place to interrupt a conversation that I hope will continue as people read the book and as we all continue to join in the struggles and protests for um, making a new world, a world where, as Francoise said towards the end, right, um, all lives are unrestrained and unconstrained. And it made me think a lot about the question of all the the protests that have been happening also for for now decades right in France by the Saint Papier and the fact that today the Supreme Court ruled here in the US right the the fact that they would not uh, disband the DACA and again um, that is not a an absolute win and it's just a very small win and it is in part not the result of a nice uh, a, a humanist thinking and forward thinking Supreme Court judges, but it is the result of people on the streets <laughs> and people doing a, what we are all engaged with both in thought and in action. So I wanted to thank Francoise so much for this book, for this conversation. I wanted to thank Donna and Matthew and Carl for joining this. I wanted to thank all our attendees, let you all know that the conversation has been recorded and will be on the consortium's YouTube channel. And um, please look for the book on the Polity Critical South um, website. Please look out for Matthew's forthcoming 
phenomenal translation of Karima Lazali's Colonial Trauma, which is a book that is very much in conversation with everything that we have talked about today. Um, and I hope to see many of you soon in person, in Zoom, and everyone, please be well. Thank you.